Good morning and welcome to the Analog Devices fourth quarter and fiscal year 2021 earnings conference call, which is being audio webcast via telephone and over the web. I'd like to now introduce your host for today's call, Mr. Michael Lucarelli, Vice President of Investor Relations. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stephanie, and good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining our fourth quarter and fiscal 2021 conference call. With me on the call today are ADI CEO Vincent Roche and ADI CFO Prashant Mahendra Raja. For anyone who missed the release, you can find it and relating financial schedules at investor.analog.com. Now on to the disclosures. The information we're about to discuss includes forward-looking statements, which are subject to certain risks and uncertainties as further described in an earnings release, ADI's and Maxim's periodic reports, and other materials followed with the SEC. Actual results could differ materially from the forward-looking information as these statements reflect our expectations only at the date of this call. We undertake no obligation to update these statements except as required by law. Our comments today will also include non-GAAP financial measures, which exclude special items. When comparing our results to our historical performance, special items are also excluded from prior periods. Reconciliations of these non-GAAP measures to the most directly comparable GAAP measures and additional information about our non-GAAP measures are included in today's earnings release. Please note, we published a table on our investor webpage of historical pro forma combined end market revenue aligned to ADI fiscal quarters. As part of this exercise, we also map sub-segments to match ADI's groupings. As a result of this reclassification, about $150 million of annual revenue moved from industrial and communications to consumer for the Maxim business. And with that, I'll turn it over to ADI CEO, Vincent Roche. Vince. Thank you very much, Mike, and a very good morning to you all. Well, once again, we delivered record revenue and profits in our fourth quarter, closing out what was a milestone year for ADI. Our success was driven by our industry-leading, high-performance portfolio, and our team's strong operational execution, enabling us to better meet the insatiable demand for our products. Now, stepping back a little, 2021 truly demonstrated the vital importance of semiconductors to the modern digital age. We invested ahead of this inflection, building a comprehensive portfolio to better solve our customers' most complex problems in this ubiquitously sensed and connected world. As we enter 2022, our backlog and bookings remain robust, and we continue to invest in manufacturing capacity, positioning us well for another successful year ahead. Now, moving on to our results, our fourth quarter revenue was $2.34 billion, and EPS was $1.73, both exceeding the midpoint of guidance. And for 2021, our revenue was $7.32 billion, and EPS was 6.46. Looking at organic ADI, we delivered new high water marks on revenue and profits. Industrial and automotive achieved record revenue this year, while consumer returned to annual growth for the first time since 2017. And communications revenue declined as continued strength in wired was offset by weakness in wireless related to the China market. In 2021, we generated a record $2.4 billion of free cash flow, equating to a free cash flow margin of approximately 33%. This maintains our position in the top 10% of the S&P 500. In line with our revised capital allocation strategy to return 100% of free cash flow, we returned $3.7 billion to shareholders in 2021 through dividends and share buybacks. It was not only a record year for performance and shareholder returns, but also for investments that position us to better capture market opportunities presented by secular growth drivers in our business. First, we took decisive action to add capacity throughout the year, with more than $340 million in capital expenditures. This is enabling us to better navigate the near-term supply demand imbalance while achieving our long-term growth objectives. And in 2022, we're planning to expand our internal manufacturing capacity at our factories in the U.S. and Europe. These additional investments will create more profitable, flexible, and resilient manufacturing capabilities at ADI. Now, at our core, we're an innovation-driven enterprise, and together with Maxim, we will invest more than $1.6 billion in R&D annually, 
to ensure we continue developing solutions that define the edge of possible. As you know, to complement our organic efforts, we selectively use m and to expand both our scale and our scope. In 2017, the acquisition of LTC reflected this strategy. Since acquiring the franchise, we delivered on our goal to double its historical growth rate. Equally impressive was our ability to improve on Linear's industry-leading gross margins. More recently, we completed the acquisition of Maxim Integrated. Similar to previous acquisitions, we're combining the best from ADI and Maxim to develop a new operating system that enhances customer engagement and drives long-term profitable growth. And I'm very pleased with the progress that we've made already. On the customer engagement side, the integration of our field teams has brought a tremendous degree of excitement. The team is already beginning to identify cross-selling opportunities and building out our opportunity pipeline. From an engineering and operations perspective, our teams are coming together at a remarkable speed, and we're aligning product and technology roadmaps to help accelerate growth in the years ahead. This combination also strengthens the diversity of our portfolio and enriches our resilient business model. To that end, we now have approximately 75,000 product SKUs, and 80% of these products individually account for less than 0.1% of our total revenue. And the addition of Maxim provides us with a more comprehensive power portfolio. Maxim's primarily application-focused power offerings are highly complementary with ADI's more general purpose or catalog power portfolio. This adds new SAM in all our markets and enhances cross-selling opportunities, accelerating revenue growth in our $2 billion plus power portfolio. Given these investments, we enter 2022 with an unparalleled portfolio of technology and talent aimed at capitalizing on the secular growth trends across all our markets. And now I'd like to share a few examples of how our business is at the heart of these emerging trends. Starting with industrial, 2021 was a banner year for, for our highly diversified and profitable industrial business, with all applications achieving all-time highs. Our unrivaled high-performance portfolio continues to benefit from the mass digitalization movement across industries. Our largest industrial segment, instrumentation and test, is comprised of automated test equipment, electronic test and measurement, and scientific instruments. These applications must combat increasing test times as system complexity and metrology requirements rise exponentially. For example, Processors and memory in data centers are leveraging finer node geometries with higher levels of integration, which can double the test time. This challenge is our opportunity. Our innovative, purpose-built solutions are bringing test time back to parity while increasing our content by more than 50%. Factory automation is one of our largest industrial segments. I believe we're at a tipping point in Industry 4.0 as customers are looking to add sensing, edge processing, and connectivity to make their supply chains more robust, efficient, and, of course, flexible. ADI's precision signal chain and power franchises, sensing technologies, and robust wired and wireless connectivity are critical to enabling these efforts. Looking ahead, we have an enormous opportunity to connect Maxim's rich power portfolio, which is underrepresented in the industrial sector today, with ADI's strong position. Shifting now to automotive, in a year dominated by chip shortage headlines, we achieved record revenue as consumers and manufacturers are embracing electric vehicles and an enhanced in-vehicle experience. These two areas need additional semiconductor content and align very well with the strengths of both ADI and Maxim. In electric vehicles, our market-leading wired and wireless battery management systems, or BMS, offer customers the highest levels of accuracy, reliability, and safety, as well as flexibility 
to scale across all battery chemistries, including the more environmentally friendly zero cobalt LFP. Our BMS position is further strengthened with Maxim. We now sell to seven of the top 10 EV manufacturers, and our increased technology and product scale enables us to address new SEM. Power efficiency is also critical in electric vehicles to better optimize performance and range. Here, Maxim's strong and growing power management capabilities complement our portfolio. Now, inside the vehicle, automakers are enhancing the in-cabin experience. ADI's market-leading audio systems with signal processing, A to B connectivity, and active road noise cancellation continues to gain traction. In 2021, our A to B franchise was designed in at five major OEMs. And since its launch in 2016, we've shipped over 50 million A to B nodes, and we expect this to double within the next three years. With Maxim, our in-cabin connectivity offerings expand to include their industry-leading GMSL franchise, which is critical in architecting, architecting advanced driver assistance systems. Turning to communications, 2021 was an uneven year as strength in wired was offset by weakness in the China wireless market. Encouragingly, as we look to 2022, the proliferation of 5G is gaining momentum globally, especially in North America. In the wireless market, ADI is the leader with more than double the market share of our closest competitor. This year, we introduced the industry's first software-defined radio transceiver that includes a fully integrated digital front end. This next generation transceiver platform enables us to defend and extend our position in traditional 5G and emerging ORAN networks. Additionally, Maxim's power portfolio will support our goal to increase our power attach rate in the wireless market. In our wired business, we grew again this year as data centers and networking became increasingly vital to accelerating digitalization. Maxim more than doubles our exposure to data centers and adds new growth vectors with its power management solutions for cloud processors and accelerators. And momentum is building with a strong pipeline across traditional customers as well as hyperscalers. Finally, moving on to consumer, our business delivered double-digit growth this year as we executed on our strategy to diversify our customers' products and applications. Maxim further builds on these efforts, bringing additional power, audio, and sensing capabilities, and adding new applications like fast charging and gaming. Given the strong pipeline and design wins for our signal processing solutions across hearables, wearables, and professional audio video, combined with our power management capabilities, I'm confident that we're on the path for continued growth. Now I'd like to focus on ESG just a little, which is now an integral part of our business strategy. Broadly speaking, I believe semiconductors can play a major role in improving our standard of living, while also protecting our planetary health. For example, ADI's technology is critical to optimizing global energy efficiency from EVs and charging stations to sustainable energy and smart grids. We're not only investing in these applications, but they represent a meaningful and growing portion of ADI's revenue today. So we've made substantial progress on our ESG initiatives in 2021, including a commitment to increase the use of sustainable energy for 100% of our organic ADI manufacturing activities by 2025, up from 50% today. Actions like these will help us achieve our goal of carbon neutrality by 2030 and net zero emissions by 2050. We launched the Ocean and Climate Innovation Accelerator Consortium, focused on the critical role of oceans in combating climate change. And we've enhanced our disclosure and transparency on ESG topics, especially around diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
In the year ahead, we look to extend our ESG initiatives across the combined company and, of course, make further progress toward our goals. So in closing, I'd like to thank our employees and partners who worked tirelessly throughout this past year helping ADI achieve these historic results. We're off to a strong start in 2022 with continued robust demand and line of sight to capacity additions. And I've never been more optimistic about ADI's future. Our industry leading position is stronger with Maxim as we expand our capabilities to capitalize on emerging secular drivers, positioning us for faster growth in the years ahead. And with that, I'll hand you over to Prashant. Thank you, Vince. Let me add my welcome to our year-end earnings call. Except for revenue, my comments on the P&L and our outlook will be on a non-GAAP or adjusted basis, which excludes special items outlined in today's press release. Also, the acquisition of Maxim closed on August 26th. As such, I will discuss results inclusive of Maxim's contributions for approximately nine and a half weeks. I'll begin with a brief review of 2021. We delivered sequential revenue growth every quarter, leading to a new all-time high of $7.32 billion. Gross margins of 70.9% increased 180 basis points due to favorable product mix, stronger utilization, and the savings from a legacy LTC plant optimization. Operating margins of 42.4% increased 250 basis points, reflecting gross margin fall through and disciplined discretionary spending. All told, adjusted EPS increased more than 30% to a record $6.46. Turning to the fourth quarter, revenue of $2.34 billion exceeded the midpoint of our updated guidance. Maxim's contribution to revenue was $559 million. Looking at the end market results, and to give a better view into the underlying trends, I'll focus my remarks on organic ADI results. But this will be the last earnings call where we provide ADI organic commentary. Industrial represented 57% of revenue and increased slightly sequentially and 25% year over year with growth across every subsegment. For the full year, industrial increased 28%. This strong performance, once again, is a testament to our sustained relative outperformance in the industrial market. Communications represented 16% of revenue and was flat sequentially while decreasing year over year. For the year, we delivered record wired sales while total comms declined due to the weakness in China wireless, largely related to geopolitical tensions. Excluding this region, total comms grew more than 20% in 2021. And overall, our comms geographics mix shifted with North America, Europe, and Korea now representing our largest sources of revenue. Automotive represented 15% of revenue and was down 9% sequentially as the third quarter included revenue from an IP licensing agreement. Excluding this, auto was flat sequentially. On a year-over-year -year basis, auto increased 15% with BMS more than doubling, reflecting our leadership position in the electrification ecosystem. For the year, auto exhibited robust broad-based growth finishing up 36%. Consumer represented 12% of revenue and increased more than 20% sequentially and year-over-year, -year, marking the fourth consecutive quarter of annual growth. Over a year ago, we said consumer would grow in 2021, and the team delivered on this commitment, with consumer increasing 12% for the year. Moving on to the rest of the fourth quarter P&L, I'm going to speak to the results inclusive of the partial quarter of Maxim. Gross margins were 70.9%, up 90 bips year-over-year. Year. Operating margins 
finished at 43.1%, up 140 basis points year over year. Non-op expense was 44 million, and the tax rate was 12.7%. All in, adjusted EPS was $1.73, above the midpoint of guide and up more than 20% year over year. If we look at the balance sheet, we ended the quarter with approximately $2 billion of cash and equivalents, and on a trailing 12-month pro forma basis, our net leverage ratio was 1.1 turns. Building on our ESG efforts, we continue to strategically leverage sustainable financing. We're proud to be the first U.S. tech company to deploy three sustainable finance instruments with our inaugural green bond issuance, a sustainability-linked revolving credit facility, and a sustainability-linked bond offering. Specifically, this bond offering was part of our $4 billion refinancing efforts during the quarter. And as a result, we lowered our weighted average coupon to 2.7% while extending the average duration of our total debt by nearly 10 years. Inventory dollars increased slightly sequentially after adjusting for the partial quarter of maximum activity and the fair value step up of inventory related to the acquisition, while inventory days were down slightly. Channel inventory declined and remains below the low end of our seven to eight week target. Moving to the cash flow statement, for the year, cash flow from operations increased 36% to more than $2.7 billion. We generated a record free cash flow of $2.4 billion, or approximately 33% of revenue, despite CapEx more than doubling to $344 million, or 4.7% of revenue. We also returned a record $3.7 billion, or more than 150% a free cash flow to shareholders this year via dividends and buybacks, including 80% of our $2.5 billion ASR program. As a reminder, we plan to return 100% of free cash flow to shareholders. This is accomplished by growing our dividend annually with a 40 to 60% dividend payout target and by using residual cash flow for buybacks. We enter 2022 as a much larger enterprise with an attractive long-term outlook. As Vince mentioned, we plan to increase our capacity investments to support revenue growth and reinforce the resiliency and efficiency of our hybrid manufacturing model. As such, we anticipate CapEx being 6 to 8% of revenue for 2022, above our long-term model of 4%. This step up in CapEx will not impact the commitment we made in September to buy back $5 billion of shares by the end of calendar 22. So now on to the first quarter outlook. Revenue is expected to be $2.6 billion, plus or minus $100 million. Based on the midpoint, we expect operating margin to be 43.3, plus or minus 70 bips. We expect non-op expenses of approximately 50 million, a 12.5% tax rate, and a share count of approximately 530 million. Based on these inputs, adjusted EPS is expected to be $1.78, plus or minus 10 cents. For additional context, using the fourth quarter pro forma combined revenue as a base, our guide at the midpoint implies low single digit growth quarter on quarter for in Q1 for what is normally a seasonally weaker quarter. This growth is driven by an increase in B2B quarter over quarter while consumer is down sequentially. So before closing, I want to give a brief update on our maximum integration progress. Phase one of shareholder value creation is well underway, building conviction in our cost synergy timeline. We anticipate realizing over 40% of the initial $275 million OPEX and COG synergy target in fiscal 22, with the remaining coming in fiscal 23. I'm proud of the team's effort and confident this pace of execution will continue. At our analyst day next spring, 
We'll update investors on our progress, as well as provide more details on phases two and three, which relate to additional savings from infrastructure optimization and revenue synergies, respectively. Before turning to Q&A, I'd like to congratulate Mike Lucarelli on his promotion to Vice President of Investor Relations and Financial Planning and Analysis. Look forward to working with you, Mike, in this continued partnership. Let me hand it over to you to take Q&A. Thanks, Prashant. All right, with that, let's get to our Q&A session. We ask that you limit yourself to one question in order to allow for additional participants on the call. If you have a follow-up question, please re queue and we'll take your question if time allows. With that, we have our first question, please. For those participating by telephone dial-in, if you have a question, please press star and the number one on your phone. If your question has been answered and you wish to remove yourself from queue, please press the pound key. If you are listening on the speakerphone, please pick up your handset when you're asking your question. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the roster. Your first question comes from the line of John Pitzer with Credit Suisse. Yeah, good morning, guys. Thanks for letting me ask the questions, and congratulations on the solid quarter. You know, Vince, for Sean, if I exclude kind of the maximum revenue in the October quarter, the, the core ADI business just came in line with the midpoint uh, of your original range, which, which is clearly not horrible, but just given strength of business and, and kind of your pension to, to tend to give upside and the view that maybe Maxim was more supply constrained than ADI. I'm just wondering if you can help us understand that dynamic and maybe it's getting rectified in the January quarter being guided above seasonal, but were there supply constraints in the quarter that impacted either revenue and or margins and any kind of conversation around that would be helpful. Yeah, thank you for the question, John. And it's a, it's a pretty straightforward answer. In the, in the past quarter, our organic supply had uh, some impact from some COVID shutdowns in Southeast Asia that affected much of the industry. We still, we still did grow sequentially in the fourth quarter, but uh, as, as we've been talking about for the last couple quarters, our supply has been limited and revenue really is a function of supply. So that hiccup uh, did put a little bit of pressure on the, uh, on the revenue line and you'll see, that, uh, you'll see that correct itself as we go forward. Thank you. Thanks, John. Your next, your next question comes from Toshia Hari with Goldman Sachs. Hi guys, uh, good, good morning. Thanks for taking the question and uh, Mike, congrats on, on the promotion. Um, I guess I had a question on, on pricing and also long-term uh, supply agreements. Uh, quite a few of your competitors or peers in the industry have talked about um, approaching customers or, or customers approaching them about long-term agreements. I, I think you gave a couple of comments on past calls, but if you can update us on how you're thinking about initi initiatives of that sort, uh, that would be super helpful, and how you're balancing that with your long-term purchases of wafer capacity. Um, and any comments on how to think about pricing broadly going forward would be super helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Tush, why, don't, why don't I take pricing and then I'll let Vince kind of speak how we think about it longer term. Uh, so in the, um, the, the, the short answer is uh, for 2021, we've been talking about rising cost inflations over the course of the year, and we've been raising our prices with a goal of neutralizing the impact to margin. Uh, I would say that in, in, the, in the fiscal year that just finished, uh, cost increases and price increases were not completely synchronized. So it's very likely that cost inflation outpaced our pricing actions for the year and were likely a, 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 modest, a modest headwind to the year. As we go into 2022, we're looking for the, for the inverse of that. We're looking for pricing net of inflation to be, uh, to be a modest tailwind to the year as uh, the price increases that have begun begin to get more traction. And, uh, and we believe that, uh, that while we still will have some cost increases over the course of the year, most of those are now baked into, into the run rate. Yeah, maybe, uh, Toshi, I can take uh, a slightly longer-term view of things. You know, I, I think it's true to say, certainly from our standpoint, that price increases aren't new. You know, we've been systematically raising prices as a company for many, many years. I think we've talked about before. You know, we continue to deliver increasing value in our new product streams. And uh, we also maintain products for our customers that are often more than 20 years in uh, 20 years old in vintage terms. Um, you know, we've taken a very measured uh, approach to pricing over the last year, and um, 
you know, we've been very transparent with our customers as well that price increases are really more about passing on costs uh, rather than looking to enhancing our margins. Uh, last comment on pricing. I think the industry, as we approach this kind of post-Moore's Law era, uh, we're in a, an era now, I believe, of structural price increases rather than cyclical. In other words, I think you'll start to see inflation sustained for the industry um, in the years ahead. Uh, you know, it's been proven over the last couple of years for certain that um, semis are, you know, the root of the modern digital economy. And I think customers understand as well that importance and the value that is increasingly created by semis. So, you know, I believe that, um, as I said, inflation will persist. Um, it'll, it'll moderate. Uh, but uh, I think it's a facet now of the, the business structure of the semi industry and indeed ADI's business. Thank you. Thanks, Sophia. Your next question is from Tori Swainberg with CIFO. Yes, thank you, and congratulations on the record results. Um, Vince, you, you're probably not going to share revenue synergy numbers with us probably until the analyst day, but could you perhaps just give us some examples of uh, you know, potential revenue synergies uh, between uh, Maxim and, and ADI, please? Yeah, thanks, Tori. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, there are many, many. I think I mentioned in the, in the prepared remarks, for example, that uh, Maxim is very underrepresented in the industrial space where ADI is very, very strong. You know, half our business, uh, total business, uh, is industrial, and uh, it's a very, very small part of Maxim's business. Um, and where I see the opportunity there is really on the power side of things, power management in particular. Uh, you know, it's the fastest growing segment in the, in the analog space. And um, I think generally across the board, we're still underrepresented as a company in power. Um, you know, we will, we today have approximately $2.3, $2.4 billion of combined power revenues. Uh, my sense is we can double that in a reasonable period of time, and we'll give a lot more detail on that when we get to the the, uh, the investor day uh, over the next couple of months. Uh, and from an application and market standpoint, I'd just like to point to data center. Um, you know the the power management solutions that Maxim has for you know companionship with cloud processors, uh, AI machines, accelerators, and so on. I think we'll combine very nicely with ADI's data center micromodules. Uh, and then in automotive, uh, connectivity, Maxim's GMSL, high-speed link technology uh, used uh, you know, in our in-cabin connectivity portfolio will enable us to optimize solutions and address a lot more applications in the car. And that's a nice companion as well to ADI's A to B connectivity solution for, for audio. And last but not least, uh, you know, Maxim has added a lot of heft to our BMS portfolio. Uh, and, um, you know, our, our portfolio now is double the size it was pre-Maxim. So, uh, and as I mentioned in, again, in the prepared remarks, you know, we now sell to seven out of the top 10 OEMs in the electric car area. So, and there's a lot more examples, but they're, they're the primary ones I'd like to point out at this, at this stage. That's really helpful. Thanks, Thank you, Vince. Thanks, Tori. Your next question is from Vivek Arya with Bank of America Securities. Uh, thanks, Vivek, my question. Uh, Vince, I just wanted to get your uh, perspective on, on the shape of kind of fiscal 22 uh, sales growth. Uh, your Q1 outlook implies I believe about 19% uh, pro forma uh, sales growth. That, you know that's well above your your closest analog peers with an acceleration from uh, Q4. Um, and if I were to assume that Q1 is, is kind of the low point of the year and you grow uh, supply sequentially, you know that that points to a double-digit sales growth. So I know you're not giving fully a guidance, but are we thinking about it the right way? And what could be the puts and takes? Uh, from a supply and then also a mix perspective uh, as we go through the year. Yeah, thanks, Vivek. So I can at least give you some shape on that. So, you know, when we look across, uh, when we look into 2022, 
uh, we can see growth across all the various market sectors uh, for the year. And I think it's possible that we'll see another double-digit top-line uh, year for ADI. And, you know, the, the primary reasons, well, we've got a very strong backlog as we enter the year. Uh, we're seeing broad-based demand continue. Um, I think also we're seeing some improvement, generally speaking. You know, with each passing month, we're seeing improvements in supply. So uh, I think that line of sight gives us increased confidence. Um, that's both internally as well as externally. Uh, you know, we're in catch-up mode on pricing. So I think you'll see some significant contribution in 2022 from pricing activities. Um, and also, uh, you know, inventories continue to remain low in the distribution channel and, of course, on the customer side, pretty much on a broad basis. So I think um, overall, 22 should shape up to be a good year. And, uh, you know, we've got many, many drivers there on our side. Vivek, uh, maybe just double-clicking on the supply item to, to provide clarity. We have um, uh, we put in uh, a fair amount of equipment orders for the uh, legacy ADI operations. So we would expect ADI capacity to continue to increase quarter on quarter over the uh, over the coming uh, coming fiscal year. On the Maxim side, uh, we've done the same, but that only, those orders only went in when when the deal closed. So given the long lead times from the uh, from the semicap guys, we're probably unlikely to see a meaningful increase in Maxim's ability to supply until the tail end of the year. So uh, uh, unfortunately, I think Maxim from a fiscal year basis, will probably be a little bit of drag on growth uh, just because it, uh, we, we can't get the tools fast enough. Got it. Very helpful. Thank you. Your next question Your is next from Abrish Srivastava with BMO. Hi. Thank you very much. And actually, thanks to Mike Good morning, for uh, providing. Good morning. Good morning, folks. Uh, I, I just wanted to say thanks to Mike for providing all the web schedule, that really goes a long way in transparency, so I really appreciate that. Um, my question is on lead times and um, the expedites. I just wanted to see what you're seeing versus what TI highlighted, which was uh, very different uh, than what we heard from other companies. So specifically, are you seeing expedites uh, narrow down? Um, and, and then where are your lead times? I think in the last earnings call you had mentioned, or in my callback, you had mentioned that 20, you had 25% hotspots. Um, so color on, on those would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, sure, Ambrish. We're, we're really not seeing much of a change. You know, the customer uh, on customer buying behavior, book, book to bill is well above one uh, in the fourth quarter. So, you know, our outlook to grow uh, quarter on quarter for the first quarter in what is normally a seasonally weaker quarter is a reference to that. Our backlog increased, uh, and we're starting 2022 with a, uh, with, with a very high level, and we have not seen much uh, change in cancellations or push-outs. So uh, we're continuing to do what we, uh, what we have been doing, and that is uh, we're reviewing with sales and ops uh, for red flags that would indicate you know, there's some level of turning in the market. We haven't seen anything uh, notable. You know, uh, really, it's, it's pretty strong across uh, all end markets and all geographies. Uh, and as we've said before, we manage our business on sell through. So we, uh, we really uh, look through distribution to get, a, to get insight from where our products are going on a, um, on a, a sell through basis to understand what's happening in terms of who's buying and where it's being shipped to. So we, you know, we're, we're prepared for things to, to change, but uh, I would say right now it continues to feel uh, as, as it did a quarter ago. Yeah, I think I'm brief from, from my perspective. Uh, you know, the number of conversations that I've been having with customers certainly hasn't slowed down. Uh, and in these conversations, it's pretty clear to me that what we're – being requested to support is real demand. So our customers are trying to get products out the door and uh, they're not building inventories at this point in time. Got it. And have the lead times um, changed versus where they were last quarter? 
Um, it's uh, on a, it depends on the product and depends on the market. So we have, uh, we have some areas where they continue to extend and others that have, uh, that have stabilized. So overall, uh, lead times are, are above normal, and it's not where we want them to be. But um, it's, very, it's very product and market specific given the diversity of what we make and where we make it. But I think it's true to say lead times have stabilized. Okay. okay. Thank you for the color. I appreciate it. Your next question comes from Stacy Rezgon with Burnseed Research. Hi, guys. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, I wanted to ask a little more about the shape of the synergies. Um, I think you'd said the cost synergies would be in 40% this year and the remainder next year. Can you give us some idea how do those split out between OPEX and gross margin and COGS? And what is the proper sort of all-in baseline for OPEX that we should be building those synergies off of? And I guess finally, um, uh, with gross margins along the same lines, given um, you've got pricing and, and other stuff as a tailwind and you see revenue growth, do you still think that Q1 gross margins, wherever they wind up coming out, is that, or is that the trough of the year, given how everything else flows through? Yeah, so Stacey, the way to think about the, uh, the cost synergies is uh, we, we said roughly 40% in the coming fiscal and then the balance in 2023. The majority of the coming fiscal will actually be in cost of goods. And then in 2023, you'll see that flip to be the majority of that coming in, in OPEX. Um, uh, what else can I tell you there? The, the um, anything else, Mike, that's relevant? The, the that's it. I'll call that that would be that's phase one. Um, we will yeah. talk more about phase two at the analyst day, and, and we'll look to increase that synergy target at that time. And I think you had a second question on gross margin. I'll pass it back to Prashant to oh, go through so the moving. What's pieces the there. proper sort of like current like full in run rate for OPEX right now? You can look at our, our one our first quarter guide, and that's probably a good level of run rate OPEX. I would say we we in that guide there is about twenty million dollars of annual OPEX we took out in our fourth quarter. So maybe add $20 million to that for, for the run when, rate when of the business. It. I'm sorry. I'm, right. I'm so on gross, yeah, on, on gross margins, you know, the, the so first quarter um, seasonally tends to be a little bit lower because we have the holiday shutdowns. And, uh, and this first quarter here uh, will have a full quarter of Maxim, which, uh, as, uh, as many of you know, had lower gross margins than standalone ADI. So we've got some, we've got some headwind coming from that. The tailwind is we've got the revenue that uh, that's coming in strong and pricing, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, is going to be uh, uh, start to be mildly creative. So, uh, all in, I would I would think gross margins, kind of sequentially, think flattish is a is a is a safe model. Got it. That's helpful. Yeah, Stacey, thanks. thanks for that. And then uh, you're, you're right on the growth margin for the year. The, the plan is for it to continue to to rise throughout the year, assuming demand remains strong and mix doesn't change, given. Synergies and also our pricing actions. Go to the next question, yeah. please. Thank you. Your next question is from Harlan Sir with JP Morgan. Morning. Congratulations on the strong results in execution. Um, on yep. the inventories, I think you mentioned that they continue to be below your target range of seven to eight weeks. And I know that on a finished goods perspective, um, at least through Q3, that was down year over year. It was down year to date versus an increase in total inventories, which implies to me that consignment or direct customer inventories are also quite lean and demand is strong. And so I guess what's, what's your view on when the team and your customers will be in a position to build back inventories or is it just hand them out for the next several quarters? Yeah, um, I, think, uh, I think it probably uh, looks to be continued hand to mouth for uh, the next couple quarters our uh, our inventory numbers are a little bit uh, a little bit uh, confusing because of uh, some of the math that's in there so I'll just go back to what I said in the prepared remarks days of inventory was down slightly um, the the internal inventory balance was up as we built uh, raw materials and whip um, you have some noise in there from Maxim's inventory being added into ours middle of the quarter, as well as the purchase, purchase accounting math, which requires us to do a step up of that. So uh, adjusting for all of that, we were, we were uh, up slightly uh, in terms of uh, ADI balance sheet inventory, and most of that was in WIP. On the channel side, it remains very, 
very lean and uh, well below where we want it to be, and that causes some challenges uh, uh, on customer service as it does for everyone in the industry. We, um, we don't see that abating uh, at least for, uh, for the first or second quarter, and you know, we, it's hard for us to see further out than that. Great, thank you. Thanks, Harlan. And Stephanie, can we go to our last question, please? Your last question is from CJ Muse with Evercore. Yeah, good morning. Thank you for taking the question. Uh, I guess a question on supply and gross margins. As you look at fiscal 22, can you speak to um, the growth you, uh, you anticipate from internal versus external supply? And, and then based on that, how should we think about the implications to your gross margins? Thank you. Internal versus external supply. Yeah. So, um, you know, CJ, the the uh, I let's let, well let's break down the dynamics on uh, on the internal supply. I mentioned that uh, ADI's internal capacity will continue to improve as we go through every quarter as we bring more um, equipment online. On the Maxim side, I mentioned that is uh, that is pretty much flat for. Uh, for most of the year, uh, we're optimistic that we might be able to see some improvement towards the tail end of the year as we get to, as we get more equipment in. On the external side, I will say that that you know Vince himself is personally involved in conversations with our uh, with our foundry partners and uh, you know looking to uh, to get additional uh, additional wafer capacity uh, when he when we can. Um, but it's you know it's very much driven by. Uh, by what nodes are available, and, and maybe I'll, I'll pass to Vince here to add a bit more comments since he's been having a lot of those conversations. Yeah, I, I think the best answer we can give you, CJ, is that uh, you know we've indicated we expect gross margins to increase throughout the year, um, and uh, you know we've we've got a hybrid model, so um, you know we expect to uh, you know against that we're we're not expecting any kind of uh, external, internal perturbations uh, that will impact gross margin, but we expect it to increase throughout the year. All right. Thank you. Thank you, CJ. Thanks, everyone, for joining the call this morning. A copy of the transcript will be available on our website, and all available reconciliations and additional information can also be found there. Thanks again for joining us and your continued interest in analog devices. Have a great Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. This concludes today's Analog Devices conference call. You may now dis